Welcome to all our students, uh, guests, um, to this evening's presentation on the Jamaican labor laws. Let's put our hands together as we welcome our presenter, Dr. Orville Taylor. My contention here this evening is that when we're looking at, at labor laws, we must understand, first of all, that we need to understand the society within which law, law exists. I'm really tired of people you know, looking at uh, laws and saying that the law says this and law says that. And I'm not just talking about industrial relations law, law on the whole. Laws at all times reflect the reality of the society. And so industrial relations law, labor law, really no difference, absolutely no difference. At all material times, I'd like to think that laws reflect the reality of the society within which they exist. And generally speaking, the ideas and the interests of the ruling classes. So if we're going to talk about the laws, we have to speak about the society. We have to speak about the history. And thus, call it a shameless plug if you wish, you have to talk about the stuff that I wrote about in the book. That's why I wrote it. Broken Promises, Heart and Pockets, A Central Betrayal of the Jamaican Working Class. There's a reason why I teach in this program and why I made a decision that I wanted to teach this program. Um, and why I'm happy that the HID is in this department because I'm unapologetically a sociologist, without any question. And for me, and I've had these major debates with the economists and other people, including some of the practitioners in, in uh, management science, that everything for me is sociology. So even when they talk about Max Weber and his theory of bureaucracy, etc., it all comes back down to the sociology. And for me, when we are studying anything, it, we have to study the society, and that's the point I was making. So, Laws, all of the labor laws, have to do with the pretty much a regulation of industrial conflict in the society. But we have to understand the society first. And so, societal conflict, yes, it does exist. And what it is, it is that conflict that exists between the, or among the various classes or various groups in society. And of course, industrial conflict is a specific type of societal conflict. And that is the conflicts that arise at the workplace or in the world of work as long as you have an employer-employment relationship. That's what you get. So if it is a relationship that doesn't involve an employer and a worker, or employees and workers, it might be conflict taking place at the workplace, but it is not industrial conflict. Industrial conflict is essentially, right, is essentially that conflict that arises out of that labor management relationship, that employer-employee relationship that is based on the contract of employment. But the reality of our Jamaican society is, and we don't want to confront it, is that we are a post-slavery society, a post-plantation society, and many of the legacies of the plantation history are with us today. As a matter of fact, they are with us tomorrow. They are that recent. And you have to ha have a deeper understanding of the history surrounding that. There are many theories about it. Um, the plantation heritage um, theory, you talk about Lloyd Beckford and Best. You talk about the plural society theory from M.G. Smith. Uh, but in essence, what you end up with is, I like to think it's really three, three Jamaicas, but you can, for the purpose of industrial relations, put it into two Jamaicas. You have an upper class, culture, you have a lower class culture, an upper class society, a lower class society. One of the interesting things about this whole model of the plantation society, and people love to talk about the way in which we have changed, and the way we have seen upward mobility, and we have seen that black people, I mean, after all, I'm standing here as somebody who's hyper melanized, and I used to look much lighter in high school, right? The AC in my office and all those things, right? But as a little, as a black man, with distinct African features to be speaking as a universal lecturer. Says something about the way in which we have had upward mobility. But we like to think that because we have seen high levels of upward mobility and we have a, we have a society, out of many one, they like to fool us that's what the society is, but it really isn't. It's out of many and one set of people running the society. But even when you have that kind, with, with that kind of upward mobility, people think that the plural society model doesn't hold anymore, the plantation society model. And what does the plantation society model say? And the plural society model says, it says, in essence, you have three layers 
a white layer up top, which is very small, but controls all of the resources and stuff, and a black layer at the bottom and a middle brown uh, buffer segment. And this middle brown segment is hybridized. It has elements of both. What is important from that analysis is that they are distinct in all economic activities. They are distinct in their economic profiles. They are distinct in their culture. But when the evidence came in the post-war World War II period, and when you got down to the 1960s, where you saw some amount of economic growth, etc., um, down to the 70s, where you had different types of egalitarian uh, activities. So by the time we got there, you now the evidence was really pretty strong. You got into the 80s, and you saw large numbers of black people moving up, and people thought that the analysis fell apart. And this is what the problem is, because people were focusing on skin color, and color matters, yes. But it's not skin color, it is cultural color. And the cultural color means that you still have those very sharp divisions, not based on skin color so much, but on all of the trappings that come with belonging in the upper, middle, or lower classes. And a consequence, think about it. We have all of the prejudices that come with it. So we evaluate people on the basis of the kind of culture that we exhibit. So I can shift my culture as I speak to you here now. Because I went to one of those traditional high schools back in the day. And when we had to do elocution contests, and we learned to hold our jaws and our lips the way that I'm holding it now, with a quasi-British type accent. Of course, I didn't, wait to, didn't go to George's. I went to St. George's College back in the day. And of course, we all talk like that. If you know it's ironic the way it talks, all of us talk a kind of way, all of us this way, yeah. Yes. Um, you know, kind of a generic, ethnic, um, almost kind of brown thing. Right, we learn to speak like that in school, and because that is how we, that is accepted mode of communication. And then, of course, you can understand the paradox of being lower class children. You go home and you speak as if you have goat DNA, and you talk like subacas, all of the boy, them million on the street, and you, right. But we evaluate people based on the way in which they exhibit the different, different types of, of, of culture. So we assume, for example, that because someone is able to exhibit the high culture, he's smarter and brighter. And we assume also that because somebody speaks with the deep rural accent or the deep ghetto accent, so they will give you the ende and wafi and dansa. Right? When they give you all of that, you say, no, he's not all particularly intelligent. Of course, when you are from southern St. Elizabeth and you are hypo melanized, but at the same time you exhibit all of the black culture, um, it is a bit of a paradox. You say, this white man sound black, and I'm still thinking of the lower class. Right? But the legacy of the plantation society is that you ended up with different attitudes towards work. There is a powerful bit of work done by a young sociologist at the time, and I still think that is one, it's among his best, better work, The Sociology of Slavery by Orlando Patterson. And I had to read it again and also look at his sources, because Patterson looked at some of the dynamics of the plantation life. And it's a curious thing that happened on our plantation, you see. Because unlike in the United States, where the majority, where all the slave drivers were white, a lot of our slave drivers were black. And they used to beat with a lot of enthusiasm that divide and rule and you get a little bit of thing. You move up slightly. And you beat with greater severity than the Busher master, or the back row master. That's where back row comes from, I hear, back row. But whatever it is, the legacy of slavery created different attitudes towards work. So on the one hand, we had employer class and employer culture. And what does employer culture tell us? It tells us that workers are worthless, and they don't want to work, and they are inferior, and they are dishonest, and they are inclined to malinga, and they will pilfer. I mean, I have some friends, quote unquote, who have legitimate jobs and say, boy, I prefer to go and work somewhere where I can do a little hustling than work somewhere with a higher salary, where I can't get no hustling. I've heard that. But it's a stereotype. On the other hand, the work was introduced in Jamaica and the Caribbean as something which 
was to be done in order to avoid punishment. It's not like when you had those guilds in Europe where you had these workers who were craftsmen, etc., and who were getting paid. No, no. Slavery took that, all of that from you. You were working, and you worked, and you worked, and you worked to avoid punishment. So work it was not something that was inherently good. It was not inher inherently enjoyable. So you did enough work to avoid being punished. And if you didn't do enough work, then beat you. Like your name, Justin Gatlin or something, or American 4x1 team. I could say the West Indies, but they have, have had enough of those West Indies jokes. <laughs> right. But that's the legacy of slavery. So what came from out of the plantation experience is that management and upper class culture, one and the same, speak differently. Lower worker class culture is blacker. But then you have some interesting things that take place during upward mobility. And there's a word I had to invent. I, I understand that after I invented it, Rex Netifer had actually invented one before that, that he called smaditization. My word was smadification, because you become smaddy. And I think it, I, I like the way that rolls off my tongue. Smaddification. Not smaditization. That sounds like Rex. Yeah, eh? Smaddification. A little bit more <clears throat> in it. <All> right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Smartification is that process by which you become somebody. So as you get your upward mobility, then you go through this amazing kind of transformation. All of a sudden, then you start, you know, removing all of the luggage that you used to carry, all the baggage from your lower classes. And then you start to spoke as if you couldn't speak before. And those people who went to the so-called non-traditional high school, so you went to... Thompson Town, secondary back in the day. And all of a sudden, everybody thinks that you went to Glenmuir. Right. Or you went to Lennon. And all of a sudden, people, you t when you become a supervisor, you start telling people you went to Mocho. <laughs> right. <laughs> Moco. Right. But these plantation type elements have remained with us. And don't forget it for a moment. Slavery is still in our minds. But apart from the plantation experience that took place here on this little piece of rock, and it is still evolving as we speak, we also had some traditions from in England. And don't let anybody fool you. They have this misguided notion, and I've always find it paradoxical. When the Americans, yeah, I'm going to say this again, when the Americans and the English talk to us about our human rights violations, Maybe somebody had a different notion of history than I had. But England was built on the notion, and the British Empire was built on the notion that human rights did not apply to anybody else except a few people in England. And American society was not built on the principle of human rights anyway. In fact, we got universal adult suffrage in 1944, 21 years before the Americans got universal suffrage. Yeah, surprise. And if you can think about it, at what point in American history was the notion that, that people of all color, right, of all races, of all uh, classes, were equal to everybody else? I don't recall that I was in the United States up to recently. Because even if, when you look at the data relating to police, etc., it's, it's not the same. Great camera, same Mr. Cameron who came here recently, yeah, put that on the tape too, not part of the script, but I put it on the tape, came here offering a prison with human rights records. But when you look at the data relating to policing and arrests, you find that there are more stops and checks in black neighborhoods and for black men driving motor vehicles, irrespective of the type, when you control it for types. So we don't have any notion. So this isn't, that is recent history. But when you go back to that period, the formative period of industrial relations, the foundation upon which Jamaican present labor laws are, 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 are built. So, follow me now. Be that period between 1760 and 1874 was one of unmitigated oppression from the British upper classes on the one hand, versus 
the working classes, white people in England. And there's something that we don't often make the connection. And the historians here don't teach it that way either. We don't teach about that group of people who were running a Jamaican society during the form formative period. We hear about the plantation owners. And the most common adjective surrounding them is that they were absentee. But nobody even decided to make the connection that the people who were absentee planters, the plantation owners, were not in England drinking tea that they stole from the, from the, the Indians. Right? That's not what they were doing. They were, down, they were building factories. So the same planter class in the Caribbean that was holding on the slaves here, right, were the same owners of factories in England. And they were passing laws. And there were so, here are some of the features of that period of the, 18, the 1700s to the 1800s. In that period, which is called the anti-combination period, if you attempted at the height of it, to form a trade union, that is, you attempted to bring a set of workers together for any other reason than to advise them of the rate of pay that you're going to be given by your employer. No, no, not to negotiate, you know. Just to be told. So your only freedom as a worker in England in, say, 1830 or 1800 was to go up on a podium, pull, pull around your, your colleagues and say, Mom, our Lord is going to be paying us the sum, the rate of five shillings per fortnight. And there's a reason why they call it fortnight, but I can't say that on tape. Mm -hmm. Right? You wait, wait for two weeks. <laughs> and something happens while you wait for the two weeks, eh? <laughs> All right. They make you wait till you um, complete the fortnight. All right. So, that's <laughs> the reality of it. In that period, that anti-combination period, you could not form work, form together with your friends and bargain. You attempted to do that, you were seen as acting in restraint of trade. That's official doctrine. No, it's just law. And there were cases which were tried, and which is why we need to understand that when we talk about law, laws don't, have to, don't necessarily mean justice. They reflect the interests of the ruling classes. So, the, the law at the time said that if you were attempting to form a trade union or a combination as they call it, because the word trade union could not be used. So, if you attempted to combine, you were acting in restraint of trade and you could be transported, like what they want to do with the prisoners. You could be transported to a country that you have never been. The most hostile environment I can think of, where you have kangaroos and eight of the ten most deadly snakes living, and we the only venomous mammal. Yes, Australia. So you're transported to Australia. So there's again another misconception in history, as we rewrite the history, that the people in Australia were just criminals. They were criminals because they were defined as criminals. They were political prisoners more than anything else. They were trade union activists. And opposition leaders. So in a time like this, now, you know, some of those purple people in the Senate would have been sent over. <laughs> be, that's why they call it the Senate. <laughs> so you'd be transported. So the, the crime was transportation. If you attempted to cause strike action, because to, for a strike to take place, you must induce other people apart from yourself. You'll be guilty of the act of conspiracy, Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you could be um, given an extremely long sentence. If you went so far as to break machinery during that period, you could be executed. That's how serious the law was then. Why well, follow me now? So if they could be doing that to fellow Britishers, fellow Englishmen, can you imagine what they were doing with us down here? So in 1842, when we came off the plantation a couple of years earlier, they passed a piece of legislation called the Master and Servants Law that was replicating the same kind of things that were happening in England. And the Master and Servants Law made it very clear that you could not combine. And worst of all, 
during the period of slavery, it was already bad enough for you to combine. So now, as free people coming off the plantation, you couldn't combine. And it is that kind of anti-worker culture coming off the plantation. So you have the anti-worker culture coming from the plantation with slavery, coupled with that anti-worker culture coming, coming from England that, ma that, that came to a head 20 odd later, 20 odd years later with Moran Bay. And in essence, and as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of Moran Bay, and some of those legacies are still with us here, that we understand that the, the commission is looking at it then and later on, because there was a commission that looked at it with a view to uh, impeaching, uh, not impeaching, arresting and charging um, Governor Eyre for his murder of George William Gordon and Paul Bogle, because it was a kangaroo court. No, not the one that Mr. Diagola said, a, a kangaroo court, a different side. But it, it was in great measure a no rent movement aggravated by the want of good labor laws and tribunals suited for the easy settlement of labor questions. It took another almost 100 years before they made an attempt to seriously change the profile of laws in this country. So in spite of the, the, the right uprising in Moran Bay in 1865, no serious labor laws were passed. You got to 1919, and there's a man called Alexander, and everybody thinks, when I say Alexander, everybody thinks of the other man. You remember him? him? Not that one, not Buster, sorry, Alexander B. But his name is Alexander Bain Alves. And Alexander Bain Alves was a very brave man. Unlike Buster Manti, who, who bear, bo, you know, was bearing his chest and daring the policeman, who knew I wasn't going to shoot him. Right? Alexander Bain Alves understood the anti-combination law, that is the master and servant's law, and he led two strikes. And good thing it was the third one, because three strikes and you're out. But he led... Two strikes because he formed two trade unions, Longshoremen Union 1 and Longshoremen Union 2. And having founded these unions, which were illegal, he led strike action and he could have been imprisoned. Things came to a head. You had a riot. The riot act was read. Just like in Moran Bay again, people were shot. Sounds almost like a couple of weeks ago. Right? People were shot. The police at the time would just run roughshod over the human rights of the people. End of the end of game. However, uh, with the intervention of a few legislators, they passed the, masters, the, the, the Trade Union Act, and trade unions were finally lawful. For another couple more years, nothing else happened. And everywhere in the Caribbean, people were upset. So by the time you got to 1935, I said 1935, because people like to behave like it started here. Jamaica was the last part. It was going on in St. Vincent, and we have this notion that Jamaica is a Caribbean. Jamaica might have the largest population, but we're not even the largest country. We don't even have the largest landmass. We're smaller than the Bahamas in terms of landmass. I surprise you. We're behind Guyana in landmass. We're behind Belize in landmass, and we're behind Bahamas in landmass. Yeah. But all a lot of labor uprisings were taking place coming up the archipelago. And what happened in Jamaica was just the last point. So we kind of got it. And Alexander Bustamante at the time was not an active trade unionist, so he didn't lead anything. He joined it afterwards. And out of 1938, a lot of things happened. We saw the, the, the uh, founding of the People's National Party along with Alexander Bustamante, who was also initially a PNP. But um, over the next couple of years, after we had universal adult suffrage in 1944, there were a few labor laws passed, but not enough to enfranchise the working class. A significant piece of legislation was passed in 1952 called the Poopsal, and if you're St. Lucia, you'd find that funny, right? P-U-U-P-S-A-L, which is the Public Utilities Undertaking and the Public Services Under um, Arbitration Law. In essence, it was supposed to deal with public sector, but it gave the government the right to intervene in other disputes. It gave the government more rights and more power, but it, give, give, it didn't give to the workers more rights to deal with their disputes. What is interesting, too, is that in 1938, after the uprisings, they passed a minimum wage law with a view to later on passing orders in order to give effect to it. 1938. 
1947, they passed a holiday with pay act. And they say they will tell you about it later on. But nothing happened for several, several years. It was in the 1960s, one other piece of legislation was passed, which was the um, National, Insurance, National Insurance Act, the NIS. But even so, there was a lot which was lacking. So by the end of the 1960s, we still had the same kind of society. The same kind of society that George William Gordon died in a hundred years earlier. A society where you were having, at this time, the economic growth, but you had a high level of social marginality, you had high levels of poverty, uh, you had natural resources being found, like bauxite, etc. But most of that, most of the economic growth was accruing to a small minority. So it was not surprising that you saw a number of riots, including the Chinese riot of 1965. And it was also a period when the government didn't even understand itself, burning books like Black Beauty, which is about a horse, preventing Stokely Carmichael from coming here, preventing Walter Rodney from coming back to his job at the UWI, bringing Martin Luther King, yeah, and bringing Haile Selassie here, but also bringing the Queen exactly in about two weeks, about two months earlier. It was a society that had not addressed the fundamental contradictions. So in 1972, this was the Jamaica that we're looking at. A post-slavery society, a colonial type of society, where you had a high levels of social marginalization and the legacy of slavery so stink you thought it was tied up with a ram goat's rope. You could smell it. The legacy of slavery, the plantation legacy, was still with us. Some things have changed. But through the holes in the Jamaican labor laws as they exist, oftentimes leak that putrid odor of the social marginalization and the legacy of slavery. The 1970s, a golden year, a golden age rather, it's so the one time in our history, and I say this without an apology, including with the present administration, the one before, and the one to come, unless they change. There's only one government in the history of Jamaica that has, that has been significantly pro-worker in terms of a legislative agenda. And that is the government of the 1970s. You did actually have an opposition that seemed to have embraced it too, because two of the, fa the figures who are in this room there, and, it, and you can look at them if you wish, Hugh Lawson Shearer, a blessed memory, and Michael Norman Manley, those two. Right. Now, two of the most powerful labor legislation in this country, the Employment Termination and Redundancy Payment Act, that's the ETIPA there, and the LRIDA, that's the Labor Relations and Industrial Disputes Act, are in fact JLP laws, believe it or not. Yeah, although they were passed in 1974 and in 1975 by a PNP administration, they, init they were initiated in 1971 by the Jamaica Labour Party under Hugh Shearer. They came to fruition. And what is ironic about that too is that those two pieces of legislation, especially the LRIDA, when it was, when it was being debated, the PNP in opposition said um, it was not a piece of legislation that they supported, kind of like what's going on in the Senate now. But as soon as it came back on the agenda, because of groundswell and whatever it was, the BITU and JLP were opposing some of the very clauses that they themselves had introduced. But that's politics for you. Politics above workers' rights. That's the history. Notwithstanding that, we have a series of labor legislation which are on our plate right now and let us look at some of the significant elements in these labor laws and we'll try to look at them chronologically so what i'm saying in essence is that we have a society a plantation society we have a society with the legacy of slavery we have a society that is highly divided we have a society with different cultures, lower class culture, which is worker culture, 
upper class, middle class culture, which is brown culture, employer culture, and those cultures don't necessarily meet and they cause conflict anyway. Notwithstanding that, you have labor laws which are supposed to be applicable to everybody, but they have little holes. And very skillful people from time to time exploit these holes to the great detriment of the worker sometimes, sometimes to the employer, but invariably to the detriment of the society. So let us look. The holiday with pay order. What is funny about the holiday with pay order? It is 1973. But the holiday with pay act was passed 1947. So, and I said it, and I've no, so I said it in the book, so I say it again, that for years the legislature sat in parliament and passed whatever it is that they passed, gas maybe, but not the laws. Imagine a parliament full of trade unionists from the TUC, the NWU, the BITU. Two, two political parties where the BITU and the, the NWU have voting rights as superdelegates. And they did not pass the holiday we would pay order until 1973. The national minimum wage orders were not passed until 1975, even though it was 1938 that the act itself was just tabled and passed, but no teeth were put in. So it was all gum. So the holiday with pay order says that the legislation doesn't apply to public officers and parastatus. Parastatus